You've planned all year for the big cruise. You've boarded the ship of your dreams, you've checked out your cabin, you've dropped off your bag, and now you're heading up to the top deck to take in the view and grab yourself a cocktail. You're here to relax and indulge, and the safety equipment on board the ship is probably the last thing on your mind. And fair enough too, because you're here for a good time. But that said, if you're a little bit nervous and you were wondering just about what kind of safety equipment there is on big ships like this, then why don't you grab a glass of something chilled, put your feet up and get ready for your safety briefing as we run you through all the equipment you should expect to find on a ship in the case of emergency or disaster. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today we're going to take a look at all the life-saving equipment that ships carry that could, maybe, one day, save your life. In the early days of ocean travel, safety was almost an afterthought. Ships' boats were essentially decorative. But as time went by and ships got bigger, technology improved to the point that safety at sea could actually become a genuine area of study and regulation. It's fascinating stuff. All ships have to carry emergency life-saving equipment, so today strict regulations for this have been developed over the past century with the SOLAS Convention, regularly updated to ensure that mandatory requirements for the carriage of life-saving equipment and appliances on board all passenger and cargo ships are followed. SOLAS stands for the Safety of Life at Sea, and the convention is regarded as the most important treaty for the safety of merchant ships today. Now, it outlines and outlaws the minimum requirements for ships' safety equipment, based on the size, the voyage, the ship's intended role, as well as passenger and crew numbers. So, life-saving equipment and appliances, including lifeboats, life jackets, life rafts, communication systems, distress signaling tools, they're all required and they're of the utmost importance. Now, the simple fact is that for the majority of a ship's career, none of this stuff should really ever truly, hopefully, be needed, all things going well. But unfortunately, not all things go well. The original concept for Sol S was devised following the most famous maritime disaster in history, the Titanic. We've talked a little bit about it on this channel before. Sol S was drawn up in 1914 in response to the Titanic disaster some two years earlier. But it was not universally incorporated into international maritime law thanks to the outbreak of the First World War. Originally, SOLAS covered things like lifeboat capacity for all on board and so on. But while many countries included the recommendations from the first convention into their own maritime law, it took nearly a decade after the war for the SOLAS convention to be adopted internationally all the way later in 1929 when the second agreement was signed. Now, just as ships are subject to rigorous rules and regulations during their design and the construction process, the life-saving equipment and the apparatus required on board ships are just as firmly checked and regulated. The International LSA Code for Life-Saving Appliances provides specific technical requirements for the manufacture, the maintenance, and the record-keeping for each life-saving appliance. Now, requirements differ from ship to ship, with minimum standards outlined in order for a ship to be considered safe for its passengers and crew in the first place. Now, this is no easy task. Modern cruise ships, like Royal Caribbean's Icon of the Seas, now carry up to as many as 10,000 passengers and crew at maximum capacity. Now, when you think about all of this, it means if something goes wrong on a ship that big, how on earth could they go about evacuating it safely? Well, thankfully, things have changed a lot since Titanic's day, and every person on board needs to be accounted for in terms of their safety. So let's go through all the ways that's done. Now, first of all, the primary piece of equipment that all ships have to carry are, of course, lifeboats. Now, we're all familiar with lifeboats, and they do come with all ships as if they're part of the furniture, but they're more than just that. Lifeboats themselves are vessels. They're launched and used in the case of extreme emergency, when a ship needs to be abandoned. Modern lifeboats come in different shapes and sizes. They're generally constructed from durable lightweight materials like FRP, which is a fiberglass reinforced plastic, and aluminium. Now, these materials are chosen for their integrity and their strength, their abilities to withstand the harsh marine weather conditions. They're also extremely lightweight. The boats are designed with inbuilt buoyancy and stability, with buoyant material all throughout the hull, the watertight compartments. Stability is also incorporated into the design, with most lifeboats being able to self-right and stabilize on their own in case they're flipped over. So all lifeboats carry rations, including fresh water, first aid supplies, navigational tools, and equipment for distress signaling. 
Now, in compliance with all those regulations, the maximum number of people a lifeboat can carry safely is dependent on the space available to ensure the comfort and safety of the occupants. So big ships like the Queen Mary II have huge lifeboats big enough to carry up to 150 passengers. Now, it's not just about the size and the number of lifeboats that's important, it's also important where those lifeboats are kept. One half of the ship's boats are kept on the starboard side, the other on the port. Regulations dictate that nearly the entire ship can be evacuated from either side independently as quickly as possible in the event that the ship was to list too far over for one side's boats not to be able to be used. Now there are actually three different types of lifeboats found commonly on ships, we've covered this a little bit before in the past. The most common lifeboat is the enclosed lifeboat. Now, these are designed to provide the best possible protection against weather and extreme conditions. Enclosed lifeboats are basically watertight, and these are the ones that are able to self-stabilize. Now, their self-sufficient life supports are built in, equipped with everything needed for survival at sea. Their covers are fully enclosed. They're made with a fluorescent or reflective material, so they have very high visibility. It serves as protection from sun, wind, and rain. They're also actually designed to collect rainwater, and they have onboard engines as well as sails, so they're completely self-sufficient. They're basically their own little ships. Most lifeboats on ships are secured on deck and to the side with huge davits. Now, they're lowered by these davits, which are essentially a, a crane with a winch system, over the side of the ship, which lowers them down smoothly at a very controlled speed. Now, the open lifeboat, as its name suggests, has no roof and is generally propelled manually using oars or with a small engine. Now, open lifeboats are becoming less and less frequent on ships as safety requirements become more stringent. As you can imagine, they aren't much help in rain or hazardous weather, and they won't keep water from getting in. However, there will generally be a percentage of open top lifeboats allocated to larger ships for dual purposes, like ferrying passengers on excursions or to spots where ships can't dock as tendering. Now, big passenger ships typically carry smaller inflatable open top boats, which are much faster than those bigger enclosed ones. This is a kind of emergency boat, which is perfectly adept at rescuing a passenger, for example, should they accidentally fall overboard. The final lifeboat is one that's really interesting, you may not be aware of it. It's called the Free Fall Lifeboat. These are typically not found on passenger ships, more so big oil tankers and things carrying dangerous chemicals. They're designed for if you need to get away as quickly as possible. Now these are usually found at the after end of the ship, at the stern, and they're designed aerodynamically so that they can be just launched into the water without damaging the boat's hull or jeopardizing the safety of the occupants inside. The boat free falls from a ramp, which provides propulsion to get it well away from the ship as quickly as possible. Now they're designed, of course, with the capacity to self-right themselves, and they're fully enclosed and watertight with shock-absorbing seats, as well as harnesses to keep all the passengers inside safe, but I'm sure it's still a wild ride. Now the secondary means of saving lives at sea are kind of like the uh, little cousin of the lifeboat, and that is, of course, the small yet mighty life raft. And rest assured, despite its small size, these things are basically almost just as important. If you've ever walked along the deck of a ship and wondered what those large fiberglass cylinders that look like big oil drums on their side are, the answer is they're simply a kind of life raft. Now these are normally located in an open part of the ship near the lifeboats. Unlike boats which need to be slowly lowered over the side of the ship, these can be deployed basically in a moment's notice. They don't need to be rigged to a davit, they can be evacuated from the ship without any kind of manual launching, and they're designed with auto-inflate systems as well, using carbon dioxide cylinders packed inside a container within the raft, so there's no time wasted trying to blow the thing up. Modern life rafts are designed with the capacity to stay afloat and exposed to all sea conditions for up to a full month. Now these little lifesavers are put through a number of tests to ensure that they can endure all conditions and continue to go. They go through drop tests, jump tests, weight tests, towing, damage, inflation tests, pressure, seam tests, strength tests, it's exhausting. But the rafts and their contents are designed very robustly so that they can continue to operate after being dropped into the water from a height of 18 meters, that's about 60 feet. On top of that, they should be able to withstand people jumping onto them from a height of about four and a half meters, that's about 15 feet, with or without their canopy. Now, bumping around in the ocean, waiting to be rescued, means that you're exposed to harsh conditions of the sea, of course, and one of the most important design features on a life raft is its canopy, with two layers of material separated by an air gap that should provide some insulation and protection against heat and cold. Now, like lifeboats, life rafts also contain all your essential items that you'd need to survive at sea, including the usuals like life jackets and provisions, but even things like pyrotechnics and flares. Now, ships carrying a davit launching system will allow a ship's crew to inflate and get people boarding a raft on deck, 
helping avoid taking on seawater if they must be inflated and boarded at sea level. The life rafts can be launched via a hydrostatic release unit, which connects to the raft container and will release even after a ship has sunk. As the ship sinks, once submerged to depths of about 4 meters, water pressure will activate the raft's release mechanism and it will inflate and rise to the surface all by itself. Now, the first thing you think of when you think of having to abandon ship and being stuck at sea is wearing a life jacket. Now look, we might all be at least a little bit guilty of ignoring uh, the safety demonstrations aboard airplanes and cruise ships, but you might want to pay attention to this next bit because the life jacket is basically the most important piece of your survival kit in the short term during an evacuation. While life jackets come in many shapes and sizes, the ones found on cruise ships and merchant ships are designed to be worn while abandoning a vessel to keep you afloat for long periods of time with features designed to help keep you alive and attract attention. Now, those found on ships are generally made with solid closed cell foam and inflatable material. When inflated, the life jacket becomes 45% more buoyant, helping the person float higher and become more visible to rescuers. Now, you can blow it up yourself, the old fashioned way, like a balloon, or using a carbon dioxide cartridge or a combination of the two. As ancient as it seems, life jackets are fitted with whistles to help survivors attract attention from rescuers. Now they're also fitted with a light which illuminates as soon as it hits the water to allow for easier detection. Similar to life rafts and other life-saving equipment, life jackets are subject to extensive testing including temperature, cycling, buoyancy, fire, stability and strength tests. Now look, even if you've survived abandoning your ship, now you might have to spend hours bobbing around in freezing water and it doesn't really take very long at all for things like hypothermia to set in. So immersion suits, also known as survival suits, are the next step to surviving after life jackets and it's a key function to help keep you warm. Now these are designed to have high warmth retention. Wearing an immersion suit will help you reduce your body heat loss for anybody in cold water and hopefully prevent the onset of hypothermia. For someone floating in waters with temperatures of 0 degrees Celsius for example, a typical suit will help keep the body temperature from going below 35 degrees Celsius for 6 hours. Now these suits are made up of water and fireproof buoyant material with reflective tape strips fixed on arms, legs and the torso for visibility. Despite looking a little awkward to wear, they're designed so that they can be put on without assistance within 2 minutes. Now you can combine an immersion suit with a life jacket, provided the life jacket actually goes over the immersion suit. Now these suits are generally provided for the benefit of crew members as a last resort. They are the ones who are expected to stay behind and actually evacuate the passengers, so if they then need to escape in a pinch, an immersion suit could prevent them from succumbing to the cold. Now this is a good one. You might think these are just here for show, but those round ring life buoys hanging up around the deck might just save your life one day. Just like the ones you might see on the beach and at swimming pools, life buoys are often fitted around the perimeter of ships, decks, for quick usage by passengers or crew in the case of an emergency. Life rings are particularly effective in the case of having someone go overboard when a flotation device needs to be deployed very quickly. So now that you've got your people away from the sinking ship and maybe in the water, we need to communicate our position. So an emergency position indicating radio beacon, or EPIRB for short, is pivotal in providing a rescue team with the exact location and the site of the disaster. Rescuers often have huge distances to cover and the inability to visually locate a vessel or passenger in distress is a real concern, so beacons assist in allowing for the quick and accurate determination of a survivor's location. EPIRBs work by transmitting geographic coordinates via radio signals to a satellite receiver, allowing rescue activities to locate the disaster site accurately, effectively and efficiently. Now, the signal will transmit that the vessel is actually in distress, as well as the coordinates via its inbuilt GPS system. Now it's mandatory for all ships to carry an EPIRB, and they're normally mounted in a secure, easily accessible location on the ship, like on the bridge or in the ship's mast. An EPIRB should only be set off in a distress situation and can be activated manually by a button or automatically when they float free of a sinking vessel. Now like the automatic function on a life raft, the EPIRB comes with a hydrostatic release unit, allowing for it to be released and float to the surface in the case of a ship sinking below 4 meters. Now while the EPIRB plays a very important role, giving a quick and accurate relaying of the vessel's location, a SART plays a bit of a different role. This is actually used for relaying the ship's location to other ships in the immediate vicinity, and it can also mark out individual lifeboats and survival craft in the water. A search and rescue transponder, or SART for short, sends out a distress signal to nearby vessels. These marvels of human technology are one of the ship's best friends in any survival situation. Passenger and cargo ships will have at least two SARTs on board as well as there being one on each survival craft. 
These battery operated devices are made of waterproof components, which keep them protected from any water damage, sunlight and other extreme weather conditions. They can both receive and transmit radio signals. They're manually activated and they respond when being triggered. For example, it activates when a ship's radar hits it. This can help preserve the battery life, so it's not always on. When it detects a radar pulse, the SART will send a signal that comes up on a rescue ship or plane's radar. Now the signal that the rescue ship receives won't identify the vessel in distress, but it will display the position of the SART with 12 trailing dots on the screen, which then become dashes as the vessel gets closer before finally becoming concentric circles around the SART's location. It's simple stuff, but it works very well. Now one of the more manual and traditional modes for attracting attention of rescuers is via signals, using hand flares, and even rockets. Now you may be familiar with uh, flares being misused in sporting events, but rest assured their primary purpose still rests with maritime safety and search and rescue operations. The Solas Convention requires that ships carry 12 rockets on the bridge, and 4 rockets are fitted in life rafts and lifeboats. A standard parachute flare is designed to be fired vertically to a height of 300 meters, that's almost a thousand feet, and burn for at least 40 seconds as it slowly descends to be effectively spotted by rescue vessels and personnel. Now these can be visible from 5 to 8 nautical miles away and they can actually continue to burn under a bit of water. Now their design ensures that they are watertight, safe to use, and easy to handle. The active ingredients used to create flares mean that they most commonly burn red. Strontium nitrate gives the flare its vibrant color, Potassium perchlorate helps the strontium burn even faster, and magnesium helps it burn very brightly. Now the final and probably the most important piece of life-saving equipment that you'll find on a ship today are probably the communication systems. So being able to alert everyone aboard the ship with necessary steps and instructions is of the utmost importance, and the first step to keeping everyone safe. All ships are fitted with general alarm systems to summon and alert their crew to designated fire or boat stations. Portable VHF radios or walkie-talkies are usually provided to emergency crew for communication throughout the ship. With numbers aboard a ship in the thousands and thousands nowadays, communication to passengers and crew is no easy feat. Passenger vessels are equipped with public address systems for this as well, so a single message can go out through the whole ship very quickly. Very high frequency or VHF radio is the most common and versatile form of marine communication. It can actually be used between ships, shore stations and via satellite. They can send and receive messages, weather conditions, and other important information, including distress signals. Communication systems are absolutely vital to the safety of those at sea. I cannot stress that point enough. And without them, confusion would reign absolute supreme. All of these systems combine to create an environment at sea that's actually extremely safe. Evacuating huge passenger ships is today an orderly and highly efficient process. Crew on cruise ships perform near daily drills and exercises to make sure they're kept up to scratch on all that equipment. It means that all of the terrible disasters we've covered on this channel before actually helped guide safety standards today and ensure travelling at sea is a less terrifying experience. Whew, well, with all that in mind, you can now comfortably go back to your pina colada and enjoy your relax by the pool. But just don't forget where your lifeboat is stored, just in case. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below, or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.